are muted. The presentation is being recorded and will be provided to registrants and posted at aasa.org. Please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box. You're encouraged to engage by posting comments in the chat box, and we appreciate all of you for being here today for our professional learning. I am Valerie Truesdale, and I want to welcome you on behalf of AASA, the Superintendents Association, where I serve as Assistant Executive Director. We are so excited to be able to share this webinar on developing effective principles, what kind of learning matters. We thank the Wallace Foundation for their support of principles and indeed all educational leaders and for their commitment to providing the research that assists us as practitioners to lead well. A new report by the Learning Policy Institute is the focus of our learning today. We all know that strong school leadership is critical for shaping productive learning environments, supporting teachers, and influencing student outcomes. This new LPI report looks at the ways that systems support the development and ongoing learning of highly effective leaders. Today's webinar explores district policies and practices that can lead to the presence of strong leaders in schools, and will share examples of districts that have successfully implemented such practices. With us today to share the report is Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, President and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute. Linda is the author of more than 500 publications. She serves as Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, where she founded the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy in Education. She also chairs the California State Board of Education. Following Linda, we will hear from Dr. Jill Baker, Superintendent of the Long Beach Unified School District. Dr. Baker has served Long Beach's 69,000 children for over 30 years. She's known nationally for building a diverse talent pipeline to serve as educational leaders in her community. And then we will welcome Dr. Calvin Watts, superintendent in Gwinnett County School District in Georgia. Calvin is formerly superintendent in Kent School District in Washington State and is known for his bold strategic vision and implementation. Joining Dr. Watts, bringing the voice of a principal is Dr. Gypsy Hernandez, principal of Coleman Middle School in Gwinnett County. Thank you all for being with us today. We invite you to lean in and learn. And that's my joy to turn this program over to Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. Thank you so much, Valerie. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am going to start by trying to share my screen. Let's see if it works. Uh, here we go. Always keep our fingers crossed for the technology. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the latest report that the uh, Learning Policy Institute uh, did for the Wallace Foundation on what do we know about how to develop effective principles, uh, what kind of learning matters. This is uh, one of three reports that were done by um, multiple researchers across the country. Uh, back in 2007, I was involved with another team at Stanford University in looking at uh, how to prepare school leaders for a changing world, another Wallace Foundation funded report, uh, in which we found out that effective principal preparation and development programs could really transform practice and increase principal success if they were designed in the right ways. Uh, and that kind of powerful preparation could really increase uh, not only the likelihood of candidates succeeding, but also staying in the principalship. But at that time, it was the case that a lot of principal preparation programs were kind of sit and get. People would show up and say, you know, I'm, I'd like to take some courses at nights and on the weekends and get a credential, get an administrative credential. Most of the people who got those credentials in most states did not go into the principalship. Uh, and there was a lot of um, concern about the extent to which they actually prepared people for the uh, real day-to-day -day experiences on the job. Uh, now, there were ex exceptions to that, of course, and we studied those. Uh, but what we've been doing now is looking to see how has the field changed in all those years. Uh, we do know, of course, that principles matter. And uh, one of the studies that was funded by um, Wallace in this round uh, actually looked at the ways in which principles uh, influence student achievement gains. And the authors of that study, uh, Jason Grissom and his colleagues, noted that it's difficult to uh, 
envision an investment with a higher ceiling on its potential return than a successful effort uh, to improve principal leadership. Uh, we've often heard the statement that uh, teachers are the most um, important in-school resource for student learning, and it is quite true that principals uh, are equally important uh, and leverage the capacities of teachers. Uh, so um, now why is my screen not moving? I'm not getting um, my screen to be able to move, so I'm going to go out of sharing and go back in. Sometimes that works. I've learned this trick, <laughs> this technology trick, and we'll see if that helps. Still not moving. I'm sorry about that. Let's stop sharing again and see whether we can figure out how to get this to, to move. All right, so our research questions included uh, what the features and outcomes of high quality principal learning uh, experiences are, how do they matter. We did a research synthesis and we also did an original study in California of the features of professional development that predict teacher retention and student achievement. Uh, to what extent do people have access to these high quality learning opportunities? How has that changed over the years? And what's the role of policy in shaping principal learning? We did a policy scan. We found that comprehensive principal preparation and professional development are positively associated with many benefits. And I'll come back and say what I mean by comprehensive. But we found that uh, the right kinds of tr uh, experiences uh, help principals feel more effective, uh, change their actual skills, their efficacy, uh, their effectiveness, teacher satisfaction and retention, and student attendance achievement and graduation rates. So what do we mean by comprehensive preparation? That has to do with the content uh, the uh, degree to which it focuses on instructional leadership, uh, school improvement, uh, school conditions, climate, uh, staff development, how to support people, and how to meet student needs. Uh, and then uh, it has to do with the strategies that are used for learning, uh, the ways in which people are enabled to apply their learning to real world uh, situations, to experience internships under the wing of effective principals, to have coaching and mentoring, uh, both during their pre-service and in-service learning experiences, and to participate in networks, professional learning communities, cohorts of various kinds. And we found that principals, um, these programs do have these um, multiple effects on both principal efficacy, uh, the experiences that teachers have uh, in schools led by those principals and that students have. Uh, here are some voices of principals about how they experienced those programs that came from the research. Uh, for me, I said one, it was the structure of the program, the projects, the way we would read something and reflect on it, have a concentrated amount of time to apply the concepts. It was through the application that you could see the big picture. The learning by doing had the biggest impact on me, and that came from the structure of the program. Another one in a different program said, now I have an understanding of what it means to create and try to live by a vision so that it guides any decisions that I make. That's a whole new understanding of what it means to be an instructional leader. And that occurs when the courses in a program are coherent and integrated with each other. And then those are also related to the uh, ways in which people experience clinical practice that uh, instantiates that vision. And a third one said, I used to think that the core work was about managing people in a school. Now, I think it's about ensuring that there is a transformation. And in order to do that, principals have to make sure that everyone is learning and engaged in the transformation. So uh, we know that it's possible to create these kinds of powerful programs. And we've also found that in our um, survey analyses that access to important topics and content areas associated with professional development has improved across the country in the areas that I noted earlier. 
over two thirds of principals had access to all of the important content areas that were associated uh, with these areas of uh, leadership. Uh, and access has been increasing. If you, in pre-service programs, if you talk to folks uh, or survey them who were certified 10 years ago versus those who have been um, certified in the most recent years, you can see that they feel better prepared and that they've experienced um, more learning in these key areas around curriculum and improvement, uh, recruiting and retaining staff, meeting the needs of English learners, uh, and you, interestingly, creating a school environment that uses discipline for restorative purposes. So you can see that the ways in which the field is beginning to um, develop a whole child approach is getting reflected in more and more preparation programs. But relatively few principals across the country have experienced those kinds of powerful learning opportunities. Uh, less than half of principals have experienced internships with administrative responsibilities and coaching, where they're really under the wing of an expert principal doing the work of an administrator for a period of time. Uh, only a third have experienced peer observation uh, at least three times in the previous three years. Uh, a little over half have participated in a principal network three or more times in the previous three years, which is not you know, a, a high rate of intensity. Um, and these things are extremely important to principals. They can describe the effects of, of the experiences they've had, for example, with coaches. Uh, this is a particularly um, detailed um, accounting of what uh, one principal learned through that coaching experience. I learned the importance of following up with a discussion about the walkthrough especially with new teachers or teachers with whom you're concerned. I learned that you should concentrate on the strengths of the teacher and be careful of how you address the areas in which the teacher might need further professional development. I learned that in order for the teacher to really receive and act on feedback, the way in which you give that feedback is so very important. I learned that being specific as to what was observed is critical and that in delivering the message, it's a good idea to do it in person. I learned that it's important to use the proper observation format. I also learned that when delivering feedback, you should be as specific as possible. These are not things that somebody learns just from reading a book or hearing a lecture. It's something that you learn uh, perhaps in part in those ways, but by uh, actively engaging in doing the work with the guidance uh, of a, an expert uh, mentor who can help you figure out how to do that work well uh, and in a way that will stick. And you can also see the critical importance of doing that work in professional learning communities, in networks or cohorts. As one principal put it, for me this group has been important because I do not feel isolated. Before I felt like I was practicing in isolation because you are at your own school, you have all these issues that arise and issues that you do not really talk to your teachers about. So it was nice to have a sounding board, being able to talk and share experiences with people who are facing similar issues. We were eventually able to problem solve around those issues together. And we hear this all the time. Uh, I'm sure this resonates uh, for everyone who's been a part of or helped to sponsor these kinds of professional learning communities. It's so important to see the work as a collaborative enterprise where you have colleagues uh, with whom you can problem solve and learn. We see also in the data that access to professional learning uh, really differs across states. Uh, among the data points that we had in the study were surveys from California, which is represented by the red bar here, and surveys from North Carolina, uh, the blue bar here. Uh, and there was much more access to professional learning in California, for example, on how to equitably serve all children, meet the needs of English learners, create a school environment that develops personally and socially responsible young people, lead schools that support students from diverse ethnic, racial, linguistic, and cultural backgrounds. The access is also very different for principals who work in low poverty schools, uh, the bottom green bar here, versus high poverty schools, the upper blue bar, uh, with much more opportunity 
uh, for principals generally in lower poverty schools. So there's work to be done, but I will say that this varies by state. So while we saw this in the national data, if you look at the California data where there have been a number of reforms of practice, there is no disparity. About 90 plus percent of principals have access to almost all of these kinds of learning and it does not vary between high and low poverty schools. So it is possible to change these uh, distributions uh, and we have work to do across the states. Also interesting is what professional development do principals want more of? And this is just sort of the top list that 70% or more of principals noted. And I will just point out that so much of this list has to do with uh, the whole child approach to leading a school, to designing a school that people are working so uh, vigorously to adopt. Principals want more learning opportunities around supporting social emotional development, physical and mental health, of course, of improving student achievement, but also redesigning for deeper learning, creating a school that develops responsible young people, um, creating an environment that uses discipline for restorative purposes, develops higher order thinking, uh, meets the needs of students with disabilities and others from diverse backgrounds, equitably serves all children. Uh, those are the preponderant uh, asks along with the traditional self-improvement, you know, ongoing improvement and uh, gains in achievement that have been put on the plate for all schools uh, for many years. So what kind of policy can make a difference? Uh, what has happened over time and where might we go to support more uh, high quality professional learning for principals? Uh, in 2005, we had only six states that focused on knowledge and skills to support student learning in their standards. Uh, some states mentioned these skills but did not specify anything about uh, the knowledge or skills. Uh, by 2014, we had 35 states that had revised their licensure standards and begun to really focus on how principals support student learning. And in 2018, there were new standards from the National Educational Leadership Preparation uh, Standards that really reinforced the equity uh, emphasis, clinical practice tied to meaningful learning. So we have seen this evolution of standards. States have been adopting these standards, uh, but states have adopted sort of a bimodal approach. All 50 are engaged in policies to improve principal quality, a lot of them using ESSA funds, and we've seen some using the uh, Rescue Plan Act funds as well for principal supports and residencies and uh, training opportunities. Uh, many states are pursuing those new leadership standards in a variety of ways, but most are on the one hand both pursuing strong requirements for programs uh, and alternative pathways at the same time. The fastest growing sector is online, often for-profit training programs. Um, and we, uh, in the course of our research, heard from um, a survey of principals in Colorado uh, how problematic those programs have been there where they have been growing extensively. In contrast to what we heard in a survey of principals from Illinois, where a much uh, more robust and rigorous approach to training has been put in place and where the views about principals' um, competencies are much, much more positive. Policy reforms can make a difference in outcomes as in Illinois and in California, as I mentioned. Uh, and some of that has to do with using these high leverage policies uh, that are really rooted in the research. Those include uh, proactively recruiting and selecting candidates who really want to be principals, reaching into the teaching force to those dynamic uh, teachers who are already uh, demonstrating leadership, persuading them that they wanna become principals and then making it possible and easy for them to do so by underwriting the costs and putting them into program models that are district uh, and um, university partnerships that support that work. The use of school leadership standards, those clinically rich internships a year under the wing of an expert principal that needs to incorporate some kinds of salary supports or an assistant principal position that uh, underwrites that. Uh, regular state oversight with feedback to programs so that they continually improve. 
uh, the expectations for the right kind of education requirements that access the topics and the kinds of learning that are important, uh, assessment, including portfolio review. We have a growing number of states, uh, including California, which have put in place an administrator performance assessment uh, that actually includes um, uh, action projects, if you will, in which uh, principals demonstrate their ability to uh, evaluate and, and support teacher learning, their ability to do school improvement planning, uh, their ability to look at the equity dimensions of a school and figure out the next steps to, uh, toward improvement. Uh, and license renewal with continuing education gives us a platform to continue to make it more uh, extensive. State progress at the point of the study that uh, looked in 2015 found only two states that met the criteria for all of these policies, 11 that didn't meet any, lots in between. But policy change appeared to influence principals access. Uh, in California, as I mentioned, there was a set of reforms which included new standards, new performance expectations, new approaches to accrediting programs, uh, a new performance assessment that members of the field helped to build uh, with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. And you could see uh, that in uh, surveys, uh, the recent completers of programs felt much better prepared uh, in many areas, although the data also show that there's still a considerable way to go uh, for ongoing improvement. Uh, they uh, mentioned not only having more access to content, but also feeling better prepared. Uh, the stronger um, uh, requirements in Illinois also produced positive changes in preparation programs. Uh, they put in place an expectation for these uh, very strong internships uh, that are year-long, the competency-based assessments uh, and the rigorous selection requirements that we mentioned earlier. And uh, studies have shown strengths in the programs and strong improvements in student achievement, especially in places like Chicago where the entire city uh, had uh, adopted programs like this uh, sooner than later. And then there's an urban pipeline project that Wallace actually funded uh, that uh, took place in uh, six uh, districts, uh, including Gwinnett County. Uh, hopefully we'll hear about that. Charlotte, Mecklenburg, Denver, Hillsborough County, New York, Prince George's County, uh, where they found that uh, where districts adopted standards of practice and really uh, applied them to hiring, preparation, evaluation, and support, uh, delivered high quality pre-service preparation, often in um, relationship to local universities, uh, used that selective hiring and placement, created a pipeline uh, of uh, leadership all the way from teaching to teacher leadership to assistant principals to principals uh, and into the central office, and then aligned that evaluation and support that they got very strong student achievement gains uh, in the schools where principals who'd had this experience were leading. Uh, this kind of approach I know is also used in Long Beach and we're gonna be able to hear from the superintendent there as well. Uh, the implications for policy and practice have to do not only with changing state licensing and program approval standards uh, and encouraging greater attention to equity where we see uh, growing uh, attention and uh, stronger outcomes, but also investing in infrastructure for professional learning like principals academies and building these local pipelines that can make such a difference in how we identify and develop talent uh, for the leadership profession. And with that, I am going to stop sharing and look forward to us hearing from uh, folks who are doing this work on the ground. Linda, thank you so much. We're gonna shift now exactly to that, the practitioner at Long Beach Unified School District. Dr. Jill Baker has been working in this area for quite a long time and is known nationally. Jill. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm so pleased to be a part of the discussion today and to share a little bit of our work in Long Beach Unified School District. 15 years ago, the only reason I left the principalship 
was the opportunity to launch a leadership development program in Long Beach Unified School District. And so the topic today is very near and dear to my heart. Our first program, which I'll talk about um, in, in depth, our coaching program, was the first program that I had the pleasure of launching. It was the first time that we had considered differently the needs of principals and what the phase of induction would mean to have a coach, what it would do to the phase of induction for a principal. And you'll all end today just by sharing that we have more than 15 programs that serve teachers and leaders who aspire into administration in Long Beach Unified School District. So let me share my screen. And actually, thank you. I need to, here we go. And let me get into present mode, just a few slides to share with you. building on our excellence and equity journey in Long Beach. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna make four connections to Dr. Darlene Hammond's research and so good to read the report and both be reminded of what makes a difference based on research and also just some new details to really think about in our work in Long Beach. So I'm gonna talk about transforming the role of principal supervisor, which followed the Wallace Foundation study about pipeline was actually one of their findings was that principal supervisors make a difference. And so we participated in the next initiative with the Wallace Foundation, which was transforming the role of principal supervisor. Secondly, I'll just share briefly about coaching as a way of being and what that has meant in Long Beach over a decade of work around building coaching to be a way of being. A little bit about how we have centered equity and, and in our evolution and leadership, how we're bringing, uh, bringing further equity into the expectations that we hold for principals. And then I'll end with a little information about our equity leadership talent development programming. So we had this rare opportunity about seven years ago. We were rethinking our evaluation systems for principals. And as we thought about that, we developed an internal system that was based on research and standards, but wanted to customize it to be really specific to our work in Long Beach. Um, and so if you imagine in between the then and now was the launch of that principal evaluation system with new expectations, new cycles of improvement and ways that we wanted to interact with our principals. The launch of that system then was complemented by establishing a principal supervisor learning community in service to principals, thinking about a reduced ratio. So our principal supervisor ratio became around 10 to one. Um, and then having a really systematic approach to supporting and supervising principals. We define the principal role, as I mentioned, the principal supervisor role around a new set of standards and indicators that was coming out of the research that we were doing internally, but also in relation to the Wallace um, principal supervisor initiative. And then lastly, we began to think about if we want to support principals who we know are second only to teachers and their effect on student achievement, we had to think about the role of principal supervisor very differently and prepare those who were effective principals to potentially be principal supervisors in our district. And so in doing so in that professional learning community for principal supervisors, while it's a small community, right now it holds 11 people in it. I still participate in, in leading our principal supervisors. We have eight direct principal supervisors to stay at that ratio. And then our equity leadership talent director participates in all of the work of principal supervisors to be able to make that connection to our pipeline program. So that the role of principal supervisor, it has standards and indicators that include teaching and learning and what the standards for a principal supervisor who supports teaching and learning look like, standards and indicators around coaching and feedback, and then just a couple of other areas. All of these have the underpinning of equity in them. And so you'll hear a little bit more about our work in equity as I take a few more minutes of your time just to share. A really important facet of our evolution and our improvement over time has been the establishment of coaching as a way of being. And that didn't just happen. So when I think about the, the transformation of the role of principal supervisor in service to principals, there was this shift that began to happen as we um, prepared more and more of our principals and others to be coaches. 
So initially there was a coaching professional development program in our equity leadership talent development program for those who wanted to be peer coaches. And as we saw the impact of coaching and our work, we decided and um, began to have all year three principles go through the coaching PD program. Because what we realized is that whether a principal is formally coaching a peer or using the skills that they're learning as coaches in support of their teachers, both were right moves, both were good for our system. And so um, that shift also was that anyone who was going into the role of principal supervisor had to be trained, specifically trained in being a coach through, through several different methodologies and I'll share that. And then other aspects that have influenced our thinking about coaching as a way of being is that we think of our systems, our evaluation systems as coaching based evaluation systems. What does that mean? That means that most of the time is spent in a coaching relationship, asking good questions, prompting for reflection, helping a leader to find solutions that they can really lead and not just direct them around solutions. And so our principal supervisors serve in the role of coach and they serve in the role of supervisor. And, and we have, there is some research that has really shown that it is possible to blend those two roles and to, to be successful. Lastly, we, we aspire to show that coaching is for everyone. And I know it's easy to go to a sports analogy and think about even the finest athletes have coaches. And so while coaching started as something that was for new principals in the phase of induction, or sometimes it was for a struggling principal, now it is for all. It is for new principals, for veteran principals, it's peer to peer. And one of the things that I love is that because coaching is a way of being in our district, sometimes in the relationships, even with me or with supervisors, we'll have a principal or a staff member say, you know, I'm noticing you're coaching me, you're not telling me, which pushes that idea back into being reflective about our practice and not just being directive about our practice. A few things that are included. So we, while we subscribe to ways of being around coaching, we don't have one approach. We have worked hard to create an internally developed program that allows our principals and others to certify as coaches um, that includes many different aspects of the toolkit uh, in their toolkit. So all of these have a foundation for us in equity. And so when we're using blended coaching, we're coaching with questions that center equity, evocative coaching, and candid and compassionate feedback, and the work of Shane Safir in, a, in Listening Leader. And so the toolkit is built through different methodologies that can be then interweaved so that anyone who's coaching can call upon the tools that are needed in that setting with the principal or with a central office administrator or someone else who they're coaching out in the field, such as their teachers. So another aspect of our work is really just wanted to share for a couple minutes about the evolution of our role over the past five years with principals and, and how we have worked to center equity in all that we're doing. While our original domains and dimensions as they're called, the performance expectations, while they included aspects of equity, over the course of five years, as we knew better and wanted to do better, we actually have been able to go back into our domains and dimensions, which essentially are a performance rubric, and to revise those. And I'll share with you what that looks like. Um, so that as central office staff learned more about leading for equity and principal supervisors were trained, including work with the Leadership Academy in New York City, that things have begun to cascade from the role of leader and now an excellence and equity policy that was passed in December of last year, where our whole system is focusing on excellence and equity. So it caused us to revise those performance expectations and some of the work just to call out some of the things that we really thought about in making that revision to our expectations was, was the work of the Leadership Academy, equity leadership dis dispositions, our work with the lens of systemic oppression, um, referring to Fisher and Fry's work around building equity. And so um, a signature practice of Long Beach is not necessarily taking something just as it's written, but thinking about where we are in the evolution of our work and then working to bring that into our space. And so what that looked like, for example, on the right-hand side, you'll see one of seven 
domains and dimensions that comprise the expectations for principles. This one is actually professionalism, disposition, and ethics. So rather than completely take a new approach to principal supervision, we took our learning from the different aspects of our work, most notably the equity leadership dispositions, thought about how they could be weaved into each of those domains and dimensions and revised our expectations over the last two years for what we expect of principals. When principal supervisors are working with principals, these domains are activated in conversations, they're activated when we're talking about teaching and learning, um, and they're a way of really ensuring that every person in our leadership system and now in our classrooms is focused on equity leadership or equity and excellence. So lastly, just a moment about our equity leadership and talent development division and their work. They were formerly called leadership development. And as we learned more and thought about how important it is to really center equity and to think about excellence and equity in combination, the division actually went through their own transformation. They went back into their curriculum and thought about the entire journey for a teacher who may want to become a teacher leader through programming, those who aspire to administration, um, and they revised their curriculum to reflect an articulated sequence of learning about e excellence and equity and, and rethinking what it means to go through this entire sequence. They also began several years ago as we learned more about coaching and the impact of coaching, our ELTD programming included in the field coaching. And so if coaching was important to us, we also wanted it to be a part of the learning. So it wasn't just coming to a classroom and talking about leadership theory, that also was being activated through coaching um, from the ELTD office. And then lastly, our promotional processes are almost exclusively through those who have participated in an equity leadership and talent development program. And so really important to us to think about how that curriculum, how the conversations, how the experiences of these almost 16 programs or 16 programs at this time, center excellence and equity. And so what's before you, and you'll have access to these slides, is an articulated way of us thinking about at the top, those who want to continue to be teachers, but want access to different learning, um, learning programs. And then at the bottom, those who aspire to take teacher leadership to the next level into administration. So again, a revised curriculum that centers excellence and equity um, and really is preparing our, our teachers and those who aspire into, into leadership roles to be the leaders for Long Beach Unified students into the next generation. What I'll close by saying is we think of ourselves always as a work in progress. And so um, what I share with you today is more than a decade of work of learning and constantly thinking about what our students need from us, how to center those needs and how to be really intentional and systematic in the work that we do in Long Beach Unified. So thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit of the connections to Dr. Darlene Hammond's research and just grateful to have the opportunity to talk with you a little bit today. Thank you, Jill, so impactful. We're gonna turn our attention now to Gwinnett County Public Schools. Dr. Watts, 180,000 children, There we go. Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate it. Yes, my wife and I have 180,000 children. We have one who we still claim in our taxes. That's how seriously I do take this work. Amazing. Welcome to you and Dr. Hernandez. Thank you so much. And I certainly uh, want to uh, just pay a tribute and, and uh, immense gratitude to AASA and certainly to our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Darling Hammond, Dr. Jill Baker for uh, setting the stage and, and really helping to center uh, some key uh, focal, focal points with regard to leadership. And as we reflect on leadership in Gwinnett County Public Schools, as Valerie mentioned, yes, we are the largest school system in the state of Georgia. Uh, and I'm humbled and honored to serve. And it is a, a bit of a, a, a home goal, if you will. And uh, I grew up personally in Washington State. However, I grew up professionally, as I often share, uh, in the state of Georgia, specifically in Gwinnett County Public Schools, from assistant principal to associate superintendent uh, for 13 years of my 21 years where I resided in, uh, in 
Georgia, my first iteration, uh, I grew up again in Gwinnett County Public Schools. So as I think about uh, our work as part of the, the largest school district, uh, there's history. And it is about ensuring that each and every leader has the requisite skill sets, knowledge, and abilities uh, to be not only a supporter, but to be effective as a leader uh, at the local school level, uh, at the district office level, as we often refer to from the classroom uh, to the boardroom, to the living room. And that's how seriously, again, we take this work. The Gwinnett uh, County model was uh, derived certainly in the early 2000s uh, based on uh, and grateful to the uh, grants uh, in aid from the Wallace Foundation as a initial seed uh, monies to support this work. I mean, our model was based on leadership development uh, with the understanding that it reflected and should reflect the, the balance between andragogy, obviously adult learning theory, and, and curriculum, what we want and intend for our, our aspiring leaders to know and be able to do as a result, whether it be serving in the classroom through knowledge-based instruction, but most importantly, as we've heard earlier from our esteemed colleagues, that experiential learning, that taking uh, this work into the field and measuring success based on student and school outcomes. And so uh, there was a strong emphasis that was placed on recruiting talent, uh, making sure that the curricula was, it was appropriate, was reliable, it was certainly valid. And, and we were leading in a way that, that not, not only identified uh, leaders as, as principals, but we identified them for a period of time that it would take one year one year for the instructional program to, uh, to move along, prepare our leaders for not just the schools of uh, the moment, but really the schools of the future. And as we reflect on when our Quality Plus Leader Academy, as it is referred to today, otherwise known as CUPLA, that Quality Plus Leader Academy experience for our leaders provided uh, opportunities for committed professionals, those who embrace the idea of leading at a higher level and to create a clear pathway forward that ensure that our, our leaders would be developed and trained specifically uh, to support and address the needs of our richly diverse uh, schools, K-12. So Cupola now and continues to serve as that umbrella, that overarching uh, scope of, of work and sequence that, that provides activities that are associated with training and development of all leaders in uh, Gwinnett County Public Schools who are uh, certainly supportive and, and included in the Quality Plus Leader Academy, specifically performing, uh, identifying those, those leaders, recruiting uh, those, those leaders with the requisite skills and preparing prospective school leaders for a school district that uh, has 140, essentially 142 uh, job opportunities. And we trust that we never have to hire 142 at one time. Our goal is to make sure we are uh, preparing those leaders to succeed whenever uh, those leadership opportunities are presented. The design itself was based on, uh, if we go back to the 1990s, 1998, uh, a cross-functional action team in Gwinnett. It was uh, actually four years before I actually, three years, I should say, before I arrived in Gwinnett County Public Schools uh, to meet the future needs of a growing county, one of the fastest growing counties in the mid 80s in this country, and a growing school district. And, and obviously that budding impact of some small event that took place in 1996 called the Summer Olympics, which happened in Atlanta. And what we also understood was that the growth that really spurred, uh, was spurred by that, that event. Uh, members of our, of our team, and, and as we refer to now as Team GCPS, continue to research uh, urban school district principal development programs such as uh, the New York Leadership Academy, uh, and and to Dr. Jill Baker, you should know, and I know that uh, your work in Long Beach uh, is revered and certainly was a part of our research and evidence-based work in, in Long Beach Unified School District, Boston Public Schools, Chicago Public Schools, Philadelphia Public Schools, all uh, understanding that we no one knows this work by themselves, but we can learn from one another and to determine that selection process, program design, which moved us to 2004, uh, the Office of Leadership Development to 2007, our first inaugural Quality Plus Leader uh, Aspiring Principal Program, which again, part of a home going, I was actually a part of that leadership development work uh, in supporting our leaders during that time. So uh, returning to the place where I grew up professionally as superintendent, 
uh, is, is not only humbling, it is inspiring uh, to continue this work and to uh, address the needs of, a, again, a richly diverse student and staff population. So as 2010 and 2012 arrived, our first induction of our aspiring leader program, uh, which supports our assistant principals. Uh, we want to make sure, as we've heard before, that cascading effect of leadership support and development. Also, in our first induction class of a district leader program uh, was also formed. And you see the numbers, 311 total graduates, more than 200 total leadership appointments, and that supports 130 current principals of 142 and 33 district leaders, one of whom you'll hear from in just a few moments. Now, as we think about leadership development, it is beyond just the development of leaders for uh, today, it is for our future. And our programs that were supported by not only teaching, uh, and certainly not just telling, but creating mentorships and opportunities for guidance in, in those who are participating in our Quality Plus Leader Academy, that, that overarching development of an inspiring principal program, otherwise known as APP, uh, to support our leaders who wish to lead at the local school level at the highest level and we often refer to what i share we have to know where we've come from in order to know where we're going i often use the analogy that it is not uh, lost on me that we we refer to that individual who was responsible for the one room schoolhouse and everything that happened inside as the principal teacher and that's the reason why we still refer to the leaders of our schoolhouses as principals and so our aspiring principal program is our seminal uh, leadership uh, program, uh, which leads to our aspiring uh, leader program, that aspirational assistant principal role, to our district leader program, understanding that central office leaders do play a significant role in the teaching and the learning that takes place in our local schools. And that district leader uh, program certainly is a balance of supervision and support from the district office to our local schools and the classrooms where our students are served on a daily basis. We've continued to grow and, and help engage our, our leaders, especially those who are also uh, learners each and every day. That, that professional learning opportunity, otherwise known as PLOs, provides for uh, that constant training that's designed to create a really a professional learning experience uh, for alignment between our newly Form district uh, strategic plan and planning process that centers on empathy and actually leads to excellence. And what we say is that e empathy and excellence are the bridge, really the bridge between that is, is actually equity and effectiveness. And so we use the four E's from centering on empathy, which leads to equity, addressing individual needs when those needs arise, then to effectiveness when we're actually creating uh, desired outcomes based on the goals in which we are attempting to, to follow. And then ultimately that excellence, excellence being described as that notable standard of excellence to, uh, to which we should all aspire. And that should be those identified outcomes. Uh, each of these programs uh, are uh, certainly in support of that constant uh, value of learning uh, continuously. And as we speak, uh, I'm actually, as we uh, prepare for through, through this leadership opportunity today, I'm humbled that uh, towards the end, I will actually be transitioning to uh, our summer leadership conference, which will begin tomorrow. And that's an, uh, another our signature uh, learning event that brings our district level leaders, uh, principals together to continue this learning opportunity uh, along with our board members uh, as a, this esprit de corps and to help us build that bridge from the end of our 2022 year to the beginning of our 2022-23 year. It is uh, exciting work uh, and I am proud and honored to serve. And as I think about this work as, as a leader who leads first with empathy, the goal is that we do our very best to, to understand what it might be like, what it should be like, what it could be like to walk in someone else's shoes. When we get to that point, when we can lead in that way, then we can understand to a better extent how to address individual needs. And so empathy leads to equity. And, and as I have had the opportunity to, to serve as a, a superintendent in my home state of Washington, to serve uh, as superintendent now in Gwinnett, finishing year one and having the opportunity to succeed uh, a leader, my predecessor who needs no introduction, but has served for 25 years in Gwinnett County Public Schools uh, as previous superintendent 
the shoes uh, that are left to fill are, are certainly important uh, and I accept the challenge, but I know as a leader, I cannot do this work by myself. It takes all of us. And at this time, certainly I would like to introduce uh, one of our esteemed uh, quality leaders herself, Dr. Gypsy Hernandez, who serves as principal of Coleman Middle School uh, and is, is one of, certainly it is Georgia's and Gwinnett's uh, first ever certified STEAM Middle School. Uh, Gypsy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I was thinking when I was reflecting on what to share today. Yes. I can, hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I thought about um, kind of sharing with you some of the highlights of uh, these programs that I have been part of in GCPS. I have been with Gwinnett County Public School since uh, 2005. I have been a teacher, a technology specialist. I have been an assistant principal, and now I am currently a principal. But the way we like to say it in Gwinnett is in every other responsibility you can think of that we do in our buildings um, to try to advance the work we do. Um, as Dr. Watts was talking, I was actually making my own list of all the different professional learning opportunities that I have participated. And I was kind of surprised that it has been so many. So I was part of a, a local school um, leadership academy that some schools kind of have uh, developed to imitate the process that the district follows. Uh, then I was part of the assistant principal academy, the principal acad academy. I am actually a first year principal, so I have transitioned from the uh, principal academy to the novice principal or the aspiring principal academy to the novice principal academy, which is it's been very reassuring to know that I have when I look around, I don't ever feel alone. And that is a very, very important, I would say, kind of theme when I was reflecting yesterday about my experience in leadership in GCPS. It has been a path of coaching and mentorship. There has always been a very intentional uh, attempt in GCPS from my department chairs all the way to my principals and now the leadership development office. There has always been that perception of uh, other educators pouring into you, taking the time, paying attention to you. That has been reassuring and important. Um, it also has an ongoing nature. As I just mentioned, I don't think I've ever been free of any professional development opportunities along the way. And these professional de development opportunities have been uh, twofold. On one hand, we have had the academies or the professional learning, the PLOs opportunities, but also there's an ongoing nature to what we do. There's always, um, a connection between those professional learning opportunities. They're either standard-based, which has been very fundamental to me to make sure um, I cover all the areas of what describes an effective leader. So all of our, um, the academy, the principal academy, but even the PLOs are always a standard based on those leadership standards. So that really, really serves as a compass when it comes to understanding, first off, what the work should be about in, in order to be effective. Um, but it's also in Gwinnett, there's always data and research based um, resources. We've always had access to uh, books, uh, research or uh, resources out there um, that are very data driven, uh, always also tailored to the unique needs of our district and our schools or our communities because we're a very large district. So our school clusters and, um, you know, I have lived in other states too, our school clusters are almost districts in, in, in other states. So they're, they're very, very unique. Um, but also along all that, there's always been the opportunity to reflect as a leader. So there's also those basic skills of what is not just to be an educational leader, but to be a leader and opportunity to reflect. And uh, in that coaching and mentorship is just having that thought partner 
like we call them in GCPS. Um, and, you know, I thought about one word to summarize it all. And I think all these professional learning opportunities, my path to leadership in Gwinnett has provided me with a community. I feel like I'm not alone. And there's a learning community around me that either, you know, via some of the tech platforms or through our professional learning opportunities in person summer, there's always that thought partner next to you when you need it or when you're wrestling with, you know, some of our daily challenges. So this kind of summarizes what has been my experience in GCBS. What a powerful word, community, mm -hmm. and how blessed we are that you all have been able to develop that kind of um, wraparound support for leaders. So today we've heard from two amazing exemplars of intentional and systematic leader development that has developed an ecosystem of learning among leaders. Linda, how does that play out in relationship to the research report? Well, I think it, it really um, exemplifies what we found in the research that you know the community, the pipeline that allows people to find their way uh, along the growth trajectory that is described in both of these districts. Um, and then the ways in which that pipeline is supported by coaching and uh, mentoring and uh, the, the kinds of um, applied learning opportunities within the district that really are practical as well as theoretical. There's nothing uh, better, more practical than a good theory. And when those come together, you can see the power that is represented. Uh, you know, and the job of being a school leader in this country is a very difficult job. So those kinds of supports, uh, both along the way and while you're uh, engaged in the work are just critically important. Well, we wanna thank all of you for being with us today at AASA and on behalf of the Wallace Foundation who supported this research, thank you for being here to bring it to life, to make it breathe energy into the report and show us how the policies and practices play out as our thought leader practitioners shared with us today. Thank you, everyone. Please have a wonderful rest of your summer. Thank you. Bye-bye.